Okay. Thank you everyone for attending my talk. Um, I wanna uh, talk about UX, UI opportunities everywhere, taking the leap from a different role into UX. Who am I? Uh, my name is Kalik Ray. I'm the Senior Interaction Designer for the Red Hat Developer Program. I have 10 years of design experience. I'm a self-proclaimed foodie and I love storytelling. So film, VFX, animation, video games, and writing. Uh, my responsibilities for the program um, is developer advocacy, user e experience and user interface research, uh, visual design and art direction, uh, specifically for the site, videos and content design. Um, these are some of the industries that I've uh, uh, have had the uh, privilege of uh, being a part of um, so far. So you have the food industry, film production, game development, academia, broadcast news, software design, e-learning, and VFX. Uh, so what is my goal today? To teach you how to take over the world. <laughs> no, just kidding. Um, this presentation is for people who want to break into UX or for people who also want to expand the UX knowledge. Uh, let's start with the basics. Um, what is user experience? Uh, user experience is the design of the process of building products that provide meaningful experiences to users. This includes branding, design, usability, and function. What is user interface? You know, uh, UI. Uh, that is the process of building interfaces and software and devices, but focusing on visuals. Uh, usually what you're trying to do is you're trying to create um, user interfaces that are easy to use and pleasurable, which is a subset of UX. Apologies, it's, it's actually raining over here. Uh, but we should be fine. Uh, next, we want to talk about human factors. Um, human perception is limited. Uh, we only have a certain set of eyes. Some people are taller than others. Um, you know, depending on the environment that you, you that you're in, you may be distracted. So, all in all, human perception is limited. Also, when it comes to doing activities, the same set of motor skills that you use for, let's say, uh, using a pencil, may not be the same thing that you would use for a phone. So when a person is switching or a user switching their uh, activities, they're prone to uh, having uh, errors. Um, and then lastly, when you're talking about products and services or, 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 uh, or tools that a user is using, if they make a, a, an error, the error is the fault of the designer, not the user. I repeat, the error is the fault of the designer, not the user. So uh, let's talk about the three levels of design uh, by Don Norman. Don Norman, who's an American researcher, uh, professor, and author, he's also a creation student of UX. Apologies. Uh, Don Norman proposes that you know uh, that we perceive the world uh, through an emotional system. This consists of three different levels: the visceral, behavioral, and reflective. So let's start with the visceral. This level of design refers to the perceptible qualities of an object and how it makes the user or observer feel. Basically, how does it look? Say, so take this for instance. Even, you know, you've never, you, you probably haven't been to this location, but looking at this image, you immediately get a gut feeling of what this, does this image smell like? You already know what that uh, smells like by looking at this. You could say the same thing about this image too. Um, I'm sure a lot of people know the smell of wet grass. Um, next, we have behavioral. Um, this is the practical and functional aspects of a product or anything usable that we can uh, use in our environment. Basically, how is it used? Another example, going back to the visceral level, you have here, um, you know, this is a car. Yes, it looks nice, but truly the only way you can test to know if a, uh, if a car is uh, works well is if you drive it. Next, we have reflective. This considers the rationalization or intellectualization of a product. Um, can I tell a story about it? Does it appeal to my self-image or to my pride? Basically, at the end of it all, once your user uh, uses your product, how does it make them, make them feel? So for instance, if you've ordered a meal and it came um, on time and it was delicious and it was it was it was warm and you loved it, you're more likely to, to buy from that same restaurant or that or use that same service. And so that's what you want to keep in mind when um, an end user is, is is using or trying your product. How does it makes how how does it make them feel afterwards? So why is UX and UI important? It creates outcomes. For example, if you don't have a hands-on developer experience for your users, uh, you're gonna have less developer engagement. Furthermore, if you don't even have a download button on your UI, uh, you're gonna have less uh, developer engagement because they can't even download your product. Both outcomes are facilitated by user experience and, and user interface. Furthermore, it's more than decoration. User experience defines KPIs 
uh, key performance indicators so that we can improve experiences. User experience also is inclusive of not only the user, but also the stakeholder as well. Uh, for instance, many people think of, you know, that UX is a relatively new uh, field. However, it's been used in food, food service industry for decades. For one example, you know, when you uh, eat at a restaurant, many of the menus are optimized in a way to, uh, to yield the, the, the maximum amount of profit. Um, you also have it where they actually will take items on the, uh, on, the on the menu and arrange them in a way to maximize profit. So while your stomach is getting uh, bigger, your wallet is getting skinnier. So uh, when we talk about the benefits of UX and UI, if you're a developer advocate, um, you're basically going to be able to have a deeper developer advocacy. And if you're a developer, you'll be able to make better software um, for de developers and customers. So let's talk about the four steps of practicing UX. This section is for those who don't have a UX portfolio or for those who are looking to add um, you know, more inspirational projects. So first, identify the things that you like. So for me, film animation comes to mind, video games, and learning. Next, you identify the UX and UI in your likes. So for me, film animation is VFX for video games, a user interface, and then for learning, courseware, which is an educational learning experience. Next, you identify the companies that make the things that you like. So for me, film animation is Cantina Creative. They do a lot of the visual effects for a lot of the Marvel Studio films. Furthermore, you have uh, Capcom, who's uh, noted for their uh, games like uh, Mega Man and, and Street Fighter. And then you have uh, IDEO, which is a, uh, a design agency that focuses on human-centric design thinking. Uh, next, you create UX projects inspired by those companies. So going back to film animation, uh, you can do what is known as a FUI, a fantasy user interface, which I'll go into uh, detail in a little bit. And then you have video games, a game UI, and then learning, a learning module, which allows a user to uh, learn a topic or, or, or subject. So we're going to use my past side projects as an example. So here we have AMA, Podescape, and Apple Blackboard. And we'll go into more detail with those. So the first project, AMA. This was a short film that I was tasked with uh, working on. Um, I had to create a AI that was for a, a fictional ride sharing company. Uh, the design had to be grounded um, in, in, in real existing technology, but seven years down the line. In doing this research, I realized there's another subset of UI called fantasy user interfaces. This just means fictional user interfaces designed for television and film. So, you know, I have some several notable examples that you probably recognize. In addition, here's some additional ones. You know, I would, I would um, you know, suggest that anyone check out these great series, Westworld, Mandalorian, and Cowboy Bebop. Also, um, even further down uh, in my research, I found that since this uh, involves AI, the, uh, the script called for the end user to, uh, to talk to the, um, to, to, the, to the interface. So that's another subset called voice user interfaces. And so I looked at several real world examples. Um, there's Amazon Echo, there's Apple Siri and Google Assistant. And we ended up coming up with this design here. So as you see in the, um, uh, in the demonstration, we were able to composite this um, in, uh, in BFX, and uh, we wanted to kind of make this scene a little bit more sinister based on the script. So I had to figure out a way of uh, using the UI to, to, to do storytelling. And so if you look at the scene with the camera, um, what we did was we found out that the AI is supposed to you know, uh, be monitoring the user. And so we decided to put a heart monitor in the scene. So that just further uh, shows the invasiveness of, of this uh, AI technology. And so that's what we were supposed to convey in the short film. Next, uh, here's an uh, example of when we were building the 3D model. Um, I built this in Cinema 4D, and we were able to take the voice actor's uh, performance and map it onto the, to the, uh, the geometry of the animation of the uh, 3D model. Um, it, anytime that the voice uh, actor spoke, the, um, the 3D model would move. You can do those things in, C in Cinema 4D. However, you can use open source as well. Um, Blender is a great choice. Many game studios and VFX and film production studios are using this tool. So it's free to download. So I, I, uh, I'd urge you to check it out. Um, the next project we have, uh, which is Podescape. 
Um, I would collaborate with the Red Hat gaming community of pra uh, practice on this. Uh, you can check out all of their open source games at arcade.redhat.com. The main goal was to take uh, uh, an approach to a, a storytelling uh, narrative around one of Red Hat's uh, pro uh, products called uh, OpenShift Do or Odeo. Uh, this is a command line tool that allows for uh, Kubernetes deployment. And so when you do a deployment of a cluster, you have a, a unit of software called a, a, a pod. Um, Kubernetes provides graceful termination for pods when they're no longer needed. So that, that termination is usually 30 seconds. And so for, for that time, that pod will exist, but then after the 30 seconds are up, it disappears. So we looked at game inspiration, um, the 2D retro side scrollers. So like I looked at the tech art direction of Mega Man uh, because you know, you're talking about a robot in a robot world fighting other robots. Why not use that as inspiration? Also, we had Super Mario, which was a simple game loop. Basically, don't touch the bad guys. If you do, you lose. And then lastly, uh, looked at Sonic the Hedgehog uh, for its expressive character acting. So we looked at the structure of a Kubernetes node, and we decided that we want to focus on the pod, but at the same time, uh, work on uh, conveying the same shape language. Uh, we end up with this character design. Uh, this is Otto, the pod. <laughs> We ended up uh, creating uh, examples. I was able to animate these different scenes just to show the user what part of the game that they're in in terms of the state. So here we're showing the expressiveness of Odo, showing that he's uh, uh, a, um, a program that basically is uh, created by multiple containers. Then we have the character in idle animation, and then here's a death animation as well. So here's the level design. I also implemented uh, some of the same shape language of 45 degree angles uh, from the hexagon throughout the stage. We also uh, want to use the UI in a way to communicate the grace period, basically meaning how much time you have left and also show the score um, of the number of collectibles that you can, uh, you can get during the game. Here's a test build of it. Um, it was fun getting a chance to see this uh, go live because this is really one of my first main games that I've actually worked on in, a, in an open source way. And so it was really, uh, uh, inspirational for me. Next, uh, we were talking about some of the open source tools we, that were used. Some of the vector art, um, can, uh, you can use Inkscape for that. Um, it's free and open source. You also have GIMP uh, that helped and aided, aided in us being able to edit some of the, uh, the um, animation frames within uh, the character states. And so you can use this. This is basically like the uh, equivalent of, of Adobe Photoshop, but open source. Next, we, you know, in terms of our sound design, uh, we used Audacity, which was free and open source. And I, I would urge anyone to, to try that out um, when they're, uh, you know, trying to implement sound, sound design and they're on a budget. Next, we have the project, uh, pro my, my third project, Apple Blackboard. This was a learning experience design. Um, I wanted to learn the uh, actual prototyping software. And so I created Apple Blackboard. It's basically an employee learning module for Apple Associates. And this is another subset of experience design called learning experience, which basically is a process of creating learning experiences that enable a user to achieve a desired learning outcome. So here we have the, the front page, the login. Um, I want to kind of show that you could gamify this further by you know, a, rewarding associates who, uh, you know, who uh, uh, took the time to learn the subject matter and product information. We also have like a dashboard, so you can kind of like keep track of you know what what uh, resources you've studied and which ones you haven't. Also, we want to include like different uh, uh, features for video. Sometimes people don't learn just from text. Some people learn from visuals, and some people need both audio visual. And we also had specs as well. Um, once the person is progressing, going from left to right from the product they end up into the overview and they have a quiz that basically reinforces all the information they just learned. I would also say with, when it comes to prototyping, you don't have to use uh, closed source tools like Axure. You can actually use ones like Pinpot. Uh, this is an open source design prototyping tool and it's available to the public. Now that we've learned how to uh, practice and implement UX uh, you know, in our portfolios, I want to show how I do it on my day-to-day -day, uh, work with Red Hat Developer. So here we're always implementing uh, ways that uh, help uh, users to, to have access to the most meaningful information at all times uh, when it comes to our, our, our website. We also, in terms of the art direction, 
anytime I'm designing any artifact for, for user experience, my main goal is always aiding developers and getting the information that, that they need to solve problems. Um, and also, I always try to make sure that I have design consistency throughout several assets. So if you're going from a video to a graphic or to a swag item like a t-shirt or a bag, they all have a similar uh, uh, design, uh, design language. Here are some ads that we created for content design. Uh, we want to make sure that users could, uh, you know, perceive the, the added value and understand that, you know, you don't have to take things uh, so seriously. Uh, we all, we, you know, in terms of engagement and uh, the metrics, we had, we saw a hundred percent increase in engagement based on these ads. Also, when it comes to video content, we try to find ways of, of gamifying it and, and giving pleasurable experiences uh, to very complicated uh, topics. So here we're talking about um, Reactica, uh, a, a software architecture. And so we're showing how many of the different microservices connect um, um, and, and software. Here we have um, you know, UX that you wear. Going back to what we were talking about in regards to the three levels of design, this is touches on the visceral behavior and reflective. The multicolored design pattern and the clean, cleanness of the lines uh, communicate that you know, this is a cool design. Furthermore, there's a behavior aspect of it. If you're uh, a developer who knows uh, uh, you know, CLI tools, you'd be familiar with this 65% mechanical keyboard. Um, and then lastly, the reflective, like I said, it conveys skill, you know, not only, only the best of us can actually use this, uh, this keyboard. <laughs> Next, we have uh, UX that you can read. Um, for these book covers, I actually had to sit down and install um, a, a, a Java framework, Quarkus, onto an IDE. And I got a chance to see how it worked and, and, and use its tools, uh, the live reloading feature. And so I wanted to feature it in the practicing Quarkus. And so I used the speedometer as a metaphor for that. Um, it's speed. And then when we're talking about the understanding of Quarkus, you know, you have to look under the hood. So I use that as a metaphor as well, like for the engine. Final tips that I can give, you know, get passionate about UX tools, you know, prototyping, uh, Figma, Sketch, Inkscape, Pimpot, whatever, you know, pick your poison. But I will say too, if you don't have any access to that, you can always use a pen and paper. Um, there's also animation. Um, I, I like Blender because right, right now that is becoming one of the uh, major tools of choice. You also have for augmented reality and VR, OpenXR, Adobe, GitHub. There's many projects out there to experiment with. For game engines, there's Godot, which is open source. There's Unity, and then there's Unreal. And then, you know, lastly, you know, if you, you know, don't have any user re uh, user experience research uh, experience, just you know, try to participate in it. You know, go to Nielsen Norman Group. They're always looking for opinions. You know, if there's a survey, take the survey. You know, we always want to hear your opinion. Um, also, learn editorial illustration. Editorial illustration is different from art because, yes, you can be expressive with it, but when it comes to editorial, you have to design a visual that uh, that supports a, a story and needs to support, you know, content. Um, and then we have these last two, uh, which is Font Awesome. It's a CSS font toolkit. It's open source. And then we have our very own design system, Patternfly. Uh, so yeah, get passionate about those, learn more about those, and then you can grow um, in UX. Also, my next tip is networking is key. You know, as I said before, we have arcade.redhat.com. You know, there's the uh, gaming, uh, Red Hat gaming community of, of practice. They're always looking to collaborate with uh, other game developers who want to make open source games for all. We also have, like I said, we uh, chronicle all the different games that we make uh, together on this site so you can play them, um, you know, on your own time. We also have OKD.io, which is a community distribution of Kubernetes uh, for OpenShift. So they're always looking for people to contribute and, and practice and collaborate on the best, best standards and practices for Kubernetes. We also have our own website, developers.redhat.com. Um, it's a, a, you know, a free resource where there's a lot of content on different uh, programming languages, uh, standards and practices. Um, you know, hopefully it can become useful for you as well. We also have game jams. So if you're a person that, you know, for me, I, it was kind of hard for me to kind of grasp a lot of UX and UI concepts. So what I had to do is I had to put it close to something that I love, which was video games. And so I was able to, to get a better understanding through making a game. So we have our own game jam called openjam.io. And then there's also gamejam.com where they feature many different um, ways where you can collaborate with people. You have usually like 24 to 48 hours to develop a game and you can meet great people at the same time while learning uh, different facets of, of 
you know, game development, but then also software development. We also have AIJ, which is the Professional Association for Design. For, so the, for some of those people who are maybe in more traditional roles, this may uh, help in terms of transitioning you from that traditional role into UX, because uh, AIJ is, uh, is creating more content around user experience and user interaction. We also have IGDA, which is the International Game Developers Association. They do great work and, and content and events where you meet and network with people in the game industry. We also have, uh, for interaction design specifically, the Interaction Design Foundation. They're the leading open source uh, uh, repository for uh, user experience literature. You should check it out to you know read and, and, and um, gain more knowledge. They also have UX courses and boot camps to increase uh, your proficiency in um, user experience and, and user interface uh, design. There's also the User Experience Professional Association. Um, this, this is an international organization. They have many chapters. So, you know, look online and see if you can find your local chapter and, and get involved. My last tip is how can you design for a better world if you don't know how the world works? So you need to learn empathy, uh, ethics, and get involved. So here's me and uh, several uh, Congress uh, people and, um, and uh, academics uh, raising awareness about wealth inequality and the racial wealth gap. And this was in Washington, DC. Um, here is me um, working, uh, doing a, a, a local food drive um, for my community at the time. You know, when it comes to, you know, getting involved, you need to know about accessibility. There's many barriers when you're creating products and software. Um, it could be economic barriers. It could be language, culture. It could be neurodiversity. Um, people with uh, certain um, perceived disabilities, uh, this gender, age, race, ethnicity, and casteism. So we have to, you know, if we're going to be designing for a 21st century world, we have to be able to address 21st century uh, problems. There's also dark design patterns, which are highly unethical. Here we have an example of where terms and services are hidden when you're checking out for a certain product. And in doing so, you're 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 creating uh, dark design patterns. Furthermore, there's things that are it's that are non-transparent in regards to uh, things like loot crates for gaming. There's there's now talks uh, about regulating this because it's creating you know, loot crates can create addiction in younger gamers because their brains are developing. So we have to be mindful of these things when we're creating uh, these products and services. Also, AI facial AI facial recognition um, and uh, racial gender bias. You know, when you're making these learning AI learning models, you know, are they using limited data sets? Uh, data sets. You also have um, uh, less accurate out outcomes for darker skinned men and women, and so we have to be mindful of who's you know getting a chance to even work on these products and tools. So we have to keep that in mind. On la and then lastly, we're talking about wealth inequality. Uh, the share of wealth held by the top one percent rose from thirty percent in 1989 to thirty nine percent in 2016 while the share held by the bottom 90% fell from 33% to 23%. Wealth, uh, the value of household property and, and financial assets minus the value of debts is not income. Furthermore, wealth dictates outcomes in health, education, and access. And it's, you know, wealth inequality itself stifles innovation and it happens worldwide. Let me show you why. Here we have federal, federal investment and in innovation. Um, the moon mission was a top priority uh, of, uh, for government funding, uh, NASA uh, had uh, government funding expenditures of $5.2 billion at its peak, which today's money is $46 billion. This money was invested in over 420,000 uh, 420, jobs um, for people indirectly and directly working for NASA. More than 18,000 of those people were employed at the uh, John F. Kennedy Space Center. That's roughly the same size as NASA's entire workforce in 2013. With those investments, outcomes uh, were created. Here, you know, when people think of NASA, they think of you know the rocket engineers and scientists. Here, we have a a seamstress who used to work for Playtex, a bra company. Because of the investment that was needed for the space mission uh, to the moon, uh, this woman here here went from uh, sewing bras to sewing spacesuits. So we can see how what happens when investment is is put in 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 in, in areas that creates better outcomes. So, for example, because of those investments, uh, NASA, uh, because of those investments, um, they resulted in drastic advancements in computing, upward mobility for workers, and quality of life for society. And that was only 5.2 .2 billion dollars. For the New Deal, which was, which was from 1933 to 1940, we in America invested 41.7 billion dollars in federal spending. So you can imagine outcomes uh, that that changed the lives of many people. But one of the things about wealth inequality is that 
Yes, it changed the lives for a lot of people, but many people were left out. So here we're talking about the racial wealth gap. Today, um, you know, this is numbers from uh, 2017, but it's probably uh, far worse. Uh, the median black family uh, has a, just the only, has a, a net worth of $1,700 uh, liquid with, uh, without depreciating assets. Uh, we, uh, the white median wealth, wealth household uh, has, a we has a wealth of 116,000 um, by 2017 standards. These outcomes are a direct result of historical inclusions and exclusions from public policy investments, like, for example, the FHA or the Homestead Act of 1820. Here, I want to give you an example of how can it affect you in UX. So due to market forces, for example, um, your company's banking app uh, needs to increase mortgage loans to black borrowers. You know, you as the user experience designer or user interface designer, you're making UX improvements to the app to solve the problem. However, despite your strategy, you were unaware that the banking app's algorithm uses the same exclusionary criteria that the FHA used to block black Americans from getting uh, home loans in the first place. As a result of your failed approach, your department receives less funding uh, next quarter and then people are laid off. So these outcomes affect everyone. So for me, when it comes to these 21st uh, century design problems, I'm always thinking of strategies. One is to always rely on the public record. You know, there are people that will give you opinions and hearsay on things, but you can always look at uh, the public record, which means that, you know, organizations, um, uh, research papers that have been published will give you performance of, of different metrics going on in the economy and in, and, and, and in, uh, in society. Furthermore, you have public policy. We just saw, we were talking about, you know, when NASA in, invested uh, $5.2 billion, how that ch drastically changed computing. If that didn't happen, most of us on this call will probably not be talking right now. We also have stratification at economics, where if you look at the Federal Reserve data, it breaks it down by, uh, you know, uh, wealth data by race, gender, ethnicity, uh, uh, poverty. Like you have uh, income, you have different ways that uh, that that uh, wealth data can, can be broken down. And then lastly, we have political science and sociology. Uh, political science is a study of who gets what. And sociology is how we came to be. Ultimately, let's just work to make a better world. Um, any uh, questions? Um, um, that's pretty much it. Thank you. Uh, thank you so much for that very informative presentation. Uh, we have a couple of people asking for a uh, link to your slides and resources. Uh, what I would recommend is adding these links to uh, the chat, of course, and uh, as well as to your chat profile. So if anybody looks uh, you up in, in the DevConf schedule, they will be able to access these resources. Okay, so just add it to the chat? And the shed, like the shed.com profile that you use. Okay, I, I, I probably would need a little bit more um, uh, help with that. <laughs> this is human error <laughs> going on, but, but yeah, um, oh. I can definitely do that. I can send you a direct message for the link where you can add it. Okay. Thank you. And you can post it in chat as well, so uh, our viewers can see. It. Okay, so it would, it would just be the uh, the the, um, the presentation itself. Oh, uh, whatever that you would like to share. Okay, so I will post the, that content in there. Um, yeah. Let's see, but was there any question? If not. We should be good to go then. Yeah. Was that the presentation? Super clear. Let's see. There's also a breakout room uh, if you want to discuss with people about this. Okay. Or if people are willing to come to that room, uh, I can send you the link. I can post the link to the breakout room in the chat, and people can go there. Okay. Perfect. Yeah, like let me just work that work this out. Like I said, human yeah, answer yeah. once again. <laughs> you know, so so we'll we'll do that. Um, if there's um, w was there any additional questions or anything? Uh, I do not think so. No, I don't see anything. Okay, perfect. 
So, okay, well, let me know what, what we need to do next. Um, I just wanted to come in and, and you know, hopefully this presentation was helpful. <laughs> I really liked it. I enjoyed it thoroughly. Really.